Good morning, church. Please stand if you're able for the call to worship. I'll be reading from Psalm 95, 1 through 5. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the sea and the mountains peak belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Let us pray. Father God, you are worthy of praise. There is no one like you. Father, you created us in your image to worship you. So Father, we come as your people. Lord, would you remind us, Lord, who we are in Christ and what you have done. Lord, would you receive all the praise and honor at this time, Lord, that, we'll, that we will extol your name, Lord. Lord, for you are worthy. Father, so accept this time of worship and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope will arise 
your love never fails Your love never fails Let's just pray for our tithes and offering this morning. 
Dear Heavenly Father, um, there's been a lot that's been going on this week. We know with the hurricanes in Florida, um, that's kind of moving up the coast, Lord. We just want to lift that up to you. God, we pray that it would cease. And there's just been a lot of damage and disaster. And we're just asking for your hand um, with all the communities and all those that are involved there. And even with us as Journey of Faith, as we think about how we can help out with our tithes and offerings, Lord. Just give us and the leadership wisdom in, in, um, in that area, Lord. And we thank you for the ways that you've provided for us. Just like this song, we are your beloved, Lord, and you um, pour out your love among us and in our church, God, and we want to receive it abundantly. Um, so we thank you for this Sunday and, and the communion service we're about to start, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a lot of announcements, but I'm just going to go over the major highlights. Uh, we do have a leaders meeting going on this week, October the 4th, and the big call out, I'm not going to talk about the other ones so much because we'll be mentioning them week by week, but the big call out is today after service, after you have some lunch, if you could go and we're going to be meeting in the children's classroom to discuss Harvest Festival. So. We would love volunteers. Um, it's going to be led by our children ministry director, Melissa, and also with Pastor Josh. <laughs> and so um, just come in. And, and those who are joining online, if you're not able to attend, please just reach out to Pastor Josh or um, Melissa, and so we can find out where we can get you plugged in. It's going to be a fun event, but we do need a, a lot of hands. So that's the big call out. And there is a schedule for that Harvest Festival. So I'll be mentioning those um, throughout this month, but that's the big thing today. And then I'm going to pass this off to Pastor Josh for communion. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. Good morning, Journey of Faith. For some of you guys who have uh, heard the news, I, uh, I passed my ordination council. I had my ordination council on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Journey of Faith. And so I do appreciate you guys' prayer for that. So uh, it, was a, it, was, it, was pretty it was a pretty grueling interview. I'll, I'll put it that way. They ask a lot of, a lot of hard questions, but um, it was good. It was, a good. it was good to be able to defend my faith and, and just know what I know, right? So I, I'm, glad, I'm glad. So the ceremony it will be tonight. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be officially ordained as a pastor, so... You know, Pastor Pastor Derek's been teasing me and calling me Reverend Josh. Please don't, please don't call me Reverend Josh. <laughs> but uh, it is the first Sunday of the month, so during this during this time, we do observe communion, the Lord's Supper, and um, you know there are two ordinances that we observe in church, which is baptism and, and the Lord's Supper, right? And the reason why we uh, we are commanded as a church to observe these is because it's it's set down by Christ, and it's a it's a it's a symbol of our relationship with Christ. It's a symbol of what Jesus did for us. You know, this is something that Christ set down um, to, to show us that he paid the sacrifice on the cross. So if you are a born-again believer, if you have placed your faith in Christ, um, you know, I do invite you to join us in the, in the communion and the partaking of this bread and juice. And same for those who are online. If you don't have, you know, like a little, the little bread and juice, you can use, use a bread and juice when you come, when you, if you have it there. Um, but I do want to remind us that these elements, just once again, that these elements are not, there's nothing special, there's nothing spiritual, there's nothing magical in these elements. These, are, these elements are just symbolic of our relationship with Christ. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right, not to take these elements, not to take this communion lightly. Right? I think a lot of times we've, we've been in church a lot, we do this, we do this every first of the month, so we kind of expect that we do it over and over and over again. But I want, I want us to be vigilant about not taking this lightly because this is this is us remembering who the head of the church is the head of the church is not um pastor Derek it's Christ and so our us partaking in this is a reminder of that and uh so uh Paul reminds us not to take these elements in an unworthy manner that we ought to examine ourselves beforehand so I want to just take us I want us to take a moment and just just get right with the Lord right um if there's any unconfessed sin go ahead and confess that now to the Lord and, and let's just get our hearts right with the Lord. So let's take a couple of minutes. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, in the Last Supper, he took the bread that they were all eating, and he gave it thanks, and he said, he broke it, and he said, take this and eat this. This is my body, 
which is given for you. Let's go ahead and partake of the, 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 the bread right now. And in the same way, he took the cup. Right after he took the bread, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We are no longer bound by the covenant of the, the old rules of the Old Testament. We have a new covenant, which is our relationship with, in Christ, which is through that blood. He said this, this, as he raised his cup, he said, this is the new covenant of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and, and drink of the, the, the juice. Father, we thank you for this morning. As we partake of these elements, we are reminded that you are the head of this church. And so as we partake of these elements, we, we, we are reminded to put you first. Even, even as we come together in worship, to remember that you are the head of this church, about what you did, not, for, not just for us collectively as Christians, but individually in our own lives, that what you did on the cross for us was amazing, was the most amazing display of your love for us. And so we thank you for your, your goodness to us, and I, I pray for Pastor Derek now as he comes up and, and, and feeds us your truth, your word, Lord. I pray that we would be receptive to it, that we would absorb it, that we would learn to, learn to, to go out and, and, and live it, Lord. And that can only be done in and through a humble spirit yielded to your Holy Spirit. And so we ask this in Jesus' precious holy name. Thank you, Reverend De La Rosa. Some of you, uh, I don't know, it, maybe you don't understand what ordination is. It's um, ordination, to be ordained means that a congregation or a denomination, some organization recognizes and affirms your call to full-time gospel ministry. And so I know the deacons and I were talking about it before Pastor Josh uh, would go off to the Philippines like, hey, we need to ordain this guy. And so when I went up to Pastor Josh a few months ago and said, hey, we want to talk about getting you ordained. He says, oh, don't worry. The denomination to which I belong, my home church, is going to be going through an ordination council. I said, great. You save us the work. I, I didn't mean it, but it is. It is a lot of work. But it's a good work because, man, it's like planning for a wedding, right? It's a lot of work, but you, you look forward to that time. And so I was on the ordination council yesterday and, and met many of the men who have poured their time into uh, Pastor Josh these last few years. And, and I just counted a privilege to be a part of it. And afterwards, we got together and said, well, what do you all think? Okay, yeah, let's do it. But uh, no, it was some challenging questions. <laughs> I felt for this guy. I was, he's like, and when they'd ask a question, he'd go, well, it could be, and then one of us would say, maybe, Josh, it would be this and that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's it, you know, so. But that being said, when he left the room, we talked about it. Everybody was very impressed. Number one, with your humility and your teachability. We love that. Number two, they know he's a detailist, right? He, so he was very thorough in his doctrinal statement. And number three, we just count it a privilege to recognize you are called by God to full-time ministry. So we're looking forward to sending him off to the Philippines. That will be a great thing. And we'll do something to celebrate your ordination. Um, so nobody will call you reverend. Della Rosa, nobody calls me that. I got my doctor, nobody calls me Dr. Kwan. We're still Pastor Derek, Pastor Josh, okay? But just recognize the church has called him to full time pastoral ministry. All right, let's continue on on our series on money and wealth. I, I hope this has been meaning something to you. I hope it's not going in one era like, okay, yeah, that's good, yeah, that's good for everybody else, not for me. And today we're going to be talking about an interesting subject. Um, the art of giving, I've entitled it. It's funny. What's that saying? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Yet most of us don't live that way, right? We want to get, get, get. That's what money and wealth is about. But 
in dealing with money and wealth, giving is also a big thing. Have you noticed on your online calendars, maybe you use, I use my smartphone calendar, Google calendar, whatever it is, there's a proliferation in the last few years, maybe decade, of these so-called special days. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, obviously the, the ones like Mother's Day for mom, uh, Father's Day for dad, Valentine's for your sweet, Christmas is you know, December 25th. But then they added others in the ensuing decades, administrative professionals day, right? And then not to be outdone, then there's bosses day. And, and maybe you didn't know, but the most important day, in my humble opinion, comes in October. It's called Pastor Appreciation Month. It's not just a day, it's a month. I'm giving you a clue, okay? Pastor Appreciation Month. That goes for all of us, even you too, Pastor Josh. Okay, so I'm not trying to make a special pledge, but I think it's just interesting. And not only on top of these official days and, and recognized months, there's the, the personal ones, wedding gifts, wedding shower gifts, baby shower gifts, baby birth gifts, graduation gifts. And then it gets really personal. There's your anniversary, right? And for those of you who are married, and of course, uh, there's birthday gifts for every member of the family. And so, wives, I'm, I'm going to just say it to you. Please give us some mercy and grace because we can't remember all those dates. You know, best thing we can do is try to put on our calendar, but that's about it. Now, here's a question I want to ask you in regard to this gift giving. And it's this. How many of you wait to the last minute to get a gift for your loved one, okay? How many of you wait to give that person last minute on that special day? Now, contra, okay, okay, we got one back there. How many wait to the last minute? Yeah, okay. How many of you, on the other hand, actually think about it? You plan ahead. You're like, whoa, this is a big event, and you're a week. I call uh, advance one week or more ahead, okay? I plan, you know, it's funny. When you look at, <laughs> I love wedding gifts. You get a wedding gift, and you, they give you, you're nice enough to give you the receipt, right? And you look like, wow, they just got this an hour before the wedding. You know, it's like, okay. But how many, at least a week in advance, you, get, you plan out getting a gift for the others? Raise your hand. Nobody. Okay, one, two. Okay, good. The rest of you, well, I don't care, Pastor. Just get on with the sermon. I'm not into giving. Okay. Um, you know how I can tell? Another thing, RSVPs. When we ask for RSVPs, that tells me real quickly what kind of person you are. We send out something. RSVP, please, so we can plan, right? Some of you are very immediate. I love it. And some of you... We have to call you again and contact you again because, you know, you're waiting. I don't know if it's because you're busy or you're lazy or you're waiting for the best thing to happen. Okay, there's other options I have. But it tells me a little bit about your personality. Now, be honest with you with this idea of giving. I don't get it. I don't get it because we all know the birthday is coming up, right? My wife's birthday is coming up. I know it's coming up. Then my daughter... Bethany's birthday is coming up. Then my birthday is coming up. Okay? So we remember these things. It's on the calendar. You know, guys. I know it shouldn't be hard. You know when you got married, right, guys? Okay, it should be on the calendar. It, it, it shouldn't catch you by surprise. Valentine's Day, February 14th. You can't forget that. And then finally Christmas, December 25th. So the question is, why do you and I wait to give these precious gifts? Is it because we think it's more romantic, you know, last minute uh, to, to get this kind of thing? Or again, is it just we're too lazy or too plain busy? Well, the passage we're going to look at this morning, the Apostle Paul is going to talk about the subject of giving. Not just the actual act, but also the intention and the attitude behind giving. So let's go to the passage right now. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. The Apostle Paul says this, Now about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. 
saving it up so that when I come, no collection has to be made. And then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them on your, uh, with your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. As we continue in this series on money and wealth, I find that the scriptures are incredibly practical, especially on the subject of giving. To the point, it's not just about how much we're to give, but it's about what we're to give and how we're to give. It goes into every aspect. Take, for example, this passage. In the previous chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible, the Apostle Paul is covering the theological the theological truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and its implications for us. Since Jesus has risen from the dead, and we actually talked about this in the ordination yesterday, the death of Christ is important, but the resurrection is more important. Because everybody dies, but only those who are in Christ will rise again. And so we know that our resurrection is based on Jesus Christ's resurrection. Based on this theological truth, how does the apostle end that section at the end of 15? Very practically. Look at what he says right here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Since you know you're going to be raised from the dead, that you've got this beautiful understanding, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I want to give you something. You can remember this. This is a great statement. Remember this, Pastor Josh, okay? Reverend Josh. The theology of Scripture is never devoid of the practicality of Scripture. That's one of the things that Pastor Josh and and Melissa, our children's director, and I, when we tell you a biblical truth, it's not just to tickle your ears or gain knowledge. It's how does this apply to my life? And the Apostle Paul now moves on to his next subject after he says, be firm in the Lord and do the work of the Lord. The first two words are this, now about, now about. It's the same formula he used in chapter 7, verse 1, and chapter 12, verse 1, which evidently he's answering a question from a letter that the Corinthians had sent him. And so he's going back to him. Now about that subject you brought up, well, what does it have to do with? It has to do with Jerusalem Christians having a real difficult time economically. Maybe there was a famine, maybe there was persecution, maybe there was a recession, maybe there was a hurricane. I have no idea. But the Jerusalem, there's no hurricanes in Jerusalem, by the way. Sandstorms, but not, you know. So in any case, we don't know the reason why they're in trouble. They are. And so Paul, on his third missionary journey, makes mention of this. He even says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses, uh, chapters 8 and 9, he talks about this issue. Now, please note that Paul isn't speaking about giving a tithe, your regular offering. We just took a prayer for that, right? He's calling for a collection, which implies that the money raised would be used for a specific religious purpose. This money would be used above and beyond our regular giving. In this particular case, he's taking an offering for the poor brethren in Jerusalem. For us, it would be analogous to some of the things that were just inferred. The Haitians who are struggling right now after the hurricane, or or giving to orphan families in Ukraine, or maybe giving a special offering to the Florida you know, uh, you know, Red Cross in regards to Ian. It could be this, uh, Pastor Josh is doing some work in the Philippines next year and, and he has a special project and so we take a collection for that. Or it could be a particular missionary we hear about who's diagnosed with cancer and we need to raise some money for medical treatment. But there's two things I think that's interesting you need to know about the kind of giving he's talking about right here. Number one, it was wider in scope It was wider in scope than just the Corinthians. It wasn't just the Corinthian church. There was also the Galatian church, which was one of the first churches that Paul started. And they were doing the same thing. In in this case, the need of the Jerusalem church was greater than what the Galatians could take care of. So he's now calling the Corinthians to happen. The second thing is this. It was not an, an emotional 
appeal. I mean, when, when you read the text, you kind of gather that both churches are very aware of the problem. And so Paul's not pleading with them emotionally. He's, he's coming from an idea of rational, willful giving. He doesn't run, if he had the technology at the time, he's not going to run some tear-jerking PowerPoint with some disheveled waif giving testimony where we all hand out Kleenex to each other to you know, cry over their situation. I don't think I see it too much. I don't watch TV that much. But you remember that, the children's Christian fun? I love that. That, that dude's always there. And he, he's got a very soothing voice. And he's walking through the village. And he's talking about giving to these kids. And I always remember saying, like, and it's not, you know, for 23 cents a day, you can help this child. You know? And it's not like it's hurting you. And, and it really gets to you. You see this kid before disheveled, skinny, you know, starving. And now they're being taken care of through Children's Christian Fund. And so, you know, call the number on the phone and you can get a hold and do it. That's a classic thing. But Paul isn't doing that. Right now, I want to go through and revisit the four verses, just four verses. And you're going to see there's a ton with regard to how we can give. Not emotionally, but objectively, how we can give. We're going to contrast it. Before we continue, let's just open with a quick word of prayer. That's a long intro. Father, thank you for this time. And Lord, as we go through these nine different contrasts between objective and emotional giving, Lord, I pray that our people would respond. That it's not just something that tickles their ears. Or, well, that was pretty good, okay. And then we go on with our lives. May it somehow impact the way we give. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, nine different so differences between objective giving versus emotional giving. Number one, giving based on principle versus giving on impulse. Look at what he says right there. Now, about the collection for God's people. You know, being in a church that was founded from a Korean ministry and coming from a Chinese church, I've been around Asians for about 30 years, and I'm, I'm kind of used to it, and I know it's an oversimplification, but there is a contrast between Asian culture and, and Western or American Anglo culture, and one of them has to do with spending. Specifically, most Asians I know, especially older generation, are not given to impulse buying. What do I mean by impulse buying? Do you know when you go in the grocery store, as you're going out to check out, they call those items right there impulse items. Gum, chapstick, you know, gift card. It's, it's causing you as you're walking along in the cart and you're going out, oh, I need the gum, which is, by the way, jacked up two to three times what you could get at Costco in bulk. But it's an impulse buying. Another thing I always wondered, like in the Chinese church, I don't know if it's the Korean church, the Chinese, I always bell, never would buy a soda in the restaurant. They're like, it's $3. I can get for $3 two, two liters of soda. Why would I buy that? You know, especially with no thing. They're very specific. They're very objective. They do it upon principle, not impulse buying. Now, that being said, as we said earlier, collection implied giving for a specific religious cause above general giving. And it was done because this ministry is important. Specific giving is preferable to what I call general giving because you're giving to a particular need. Take missions, for example, in a church. One of the ways you can give to missions in a church is that they just take a portion of the general budget and say, we will use that for missions. So you and I don't know where it's going to go. We just know if the church raises 100,000 and they give 10%, though 10,000 will go to missions and outreach. That's one way to do it. Another example is to say, we'll create a separate budget and take some from that specific budget to, to take care of specific needs in missions and outreach. By the way, that's how Journey of Faith does it. It's kind of a hybrid. We take a portion, but we also give specifically to ministries. Um, and so what we do, the Gerhards, we support them year round. On the other hand, we also make ourselves available to those unplanned things. Let's say we do a ministry to Habitat for Humanity and there's an additional need, or we talk to some pastors that we uh, know and they need a specific, we will take some money out and do that. 
But it's, again, it's given on principle, not on impulse. Secondly, we make the giving made by a rational appeal rather than an emotional appeal. Look at what, what Paul says. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. The Galatian church was around a lot longer than the Corinthian church. And so the Corinthians looked up to them. But if you were to take two different congregations and knew them, they're totally different. The Galatian church was more Jewish in nature, okay? And the Corinthian church was more Greek in nature. And we don't know who was wealthier, but for the Corinthians to give to a Greek congregation, a Greek congregation giving to a Jewish congregation in Jerusalem, that was pretty cool. It would be a great testimony of unity. But notice that Paul in this statement does not build up that distinction. He, he doesn't play that game. He's saying your brothers are in need. It doesn't matter whether they're Jewish or Greek. They're in need. The Galatians are helping. You help as well. It's a very rational appeal. Doesn't tug at the heartstrings. Doesn't try to, to get them to cry. He just lays out the need and asks them to respond, and they do. Now contrast that had we done some sort of emotional. If Paul wanted to do emotional, he would do something like, you know, Paul McCartney and, and uh, what's his name? Why is my brain dead? Um, Jackson. Ebony and Ivory, right? I was like, oh, gosh, that's so good. One black guy, one white guy playing together. And, well, here's you guys. You guys are Greek, and, and you're giving to these Jews. And let's just play up the differences and giving individual testimonies of how you're helping me out. Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't do it because he knows the heart can be fickle. You might be moved by it. You might not be moved by it. He appeals on a rational basis. Do brothers in need? Give. How about this one? Give on a regular basis versus giving on a sporadic basis on the first day of every week. Can I ask you, those of you, I'm hoping all of you, if you're members of the church, but can't necessarily do that. We don't, we don't check what you give. But let me ask you, those who give a regular offering, how do you give it? Do you do it at the beginning of the month? Do you do it weekly? Do you do it when you have a paycheck and the money comes in and you say, okay, I'm going to give this amount of money? Well, do you do it when you just feel like it? See, for the Corinthians, as, as Christians, they gave regularly and they would do it on Sunday. The Jews, their holy day was Saturday. But for us as Christians, it's Sunday. And Sunday is a good day to take collections because our spirit is ready to worship God. We have the offering box out there. We don't pass it around, which means you are intentionally to give. It's not just something, you know, that comes. So we hope and trust that you give a regular offering. Because, again, it doesn't appeal to your emotions. It's just a regular thing that you do. Uh, Paul is saying when you give to missions, when you give to short-term missions, when you give to your ministries, put the money aside. Do it on a regular basis rather than sporadically. How about this one? Unanimous participation versus limited participation. Each one of you. Note the giving isn't based on whether you're rich or poor, uh, whether you have a lot of discretionary income or very little. He's saying all people, whether you're rich or poor or single or married, even if you're a youth in this congregation, the assumption is that you should give. In my old church, the Chinese church, we had a ministry to the Chinese students at ASU coming over. Back 20 years ago, not recently, but back in those old days, the, the students coming from China were really poor. And we would come and pick them up from the airport, and we would help them find uh, stuff, and we'd get furniture for them and help them get a license and buy them food. We did all this stuff because they were really poor. The newer ones are not as poor, but the older ones were poor. And so uh, when we would have a ministry, food, when we had a retreat or everything, we would pay for everything for them. And I remember saying at the time, you know what, they are not wealthy, but they need to pay a little bit, five, ten, twenty dollars. Why? Because it, you lose dignity after a while. You, you know, you're, we're treating you like a, 
you know, like you have nothing to give. We had a restaurant fellowship, the same thing. Restaurant fellowship was interesting because everybody works on Sunday, right? They can't go to church on Sunday morning. So we would meet at 11 o'clock on Tuesday night. Man, that was killer when I would preach to that crew. But again, we treated the restaurant fellowship the same way. Well, they're, you know, poor workers. They don't have money. So we'd do an annual Thanksgiving bus ride up to the Grand Canyon or Sedona. They had to pay nothing. But again, because they had no skin in the game, some say, oh, they bag last minute. I don't want to go or whatever. And so they didn't treat it. And the same with youth. We're assuming, oh, you can't afford anything. You don't have to pay anything. Without asking for help, no matter how small it is from every single person, you lose the blessing of participation. So everybody should give. And you know, I thought about when our mission, let's say the Gerhards come back, um, and they say, can you imagine if they said this, I want to thank all of you for your generous donations to our ministry in prayer, versus I just want to thank those of you who actually did give and pray for us. Wouldn't it be great if we knew that all of us are supporting our mission together? So unanimous participation versus limited. Planned, well thought out versus spontaneous. You should set aside the money. Some of us have this mentality that giving is more spiritual or more special if it's spontaneous than rather it's planned out. And I gotta say, uh, I don't knock the idea of spontaneous. Giving flowers to your loved one, uh, presents or presents or cards, that's really important. One time our neighbor, our neighbor uh, Scott gave his wife two dozen roses, okay, and they're delivered. They're beautiful. She comes over to our house and says, Derek, I was home at the time. She says, I have these two dozen roses that Scott gave me, but we're leaving tomorrow for a vacation. Why don't you give them to Kathy, you know, and let her enjoy it? So I'm like, okay. So when Kathy came home and said, honey, here's couple dozen rows. And I said, oh, that's so beautiful and everything. She goes, you shouldn't have spent the money or anything. And I'm feeling really convicted. You know, I'm like, so finally I said, okay, honey, I, I didn't buy them. Our neighbor gave them to me. And so I'm regifting them to you. Um, she was actually pretty good about it because she didn't want me spending a lot of money on roses, okay? Buy her dinner instead or whatever. But the point is this. I get it when you do spontaneous giving. It, it's, it's wonderful. It, it, you know, it makes you feel good. But when you're a missionary, and, and I, I'm going to speak for Pastor Josh, well planned out versus spontaneous giving to a missionary, they'd rather have the well planned out because they're day in, day out doing their ministry. And if they're not getting that regular gift that you committed to, the church commits to the individual, they don't know what's coming in. And so they need that steady offering. They need to know that the money is coming in for them to do their ministry. Amen, Pastor Josh? Amen. Yep. Okay. I was thinking about that. For those of you who work for a company or government, you get a regular paycheck every week, right? Some of you want that. You might not make as much money as if you were in commission or you owned your own company. The problem with owning your own company or being on commission is you don't know what's going to be every week. But some of us want that steadiness. Well, in ministry, it's very important to have it well planned out. Specific amount given versus amount based on how I feel. A sum of money. Note that Paul says all to give, but he doesn't give a specific amount. Notice he says, he says a sum of money, not the sum of money. He doesn't tell each one of you are to give this amount. It's just a. And so we encourage each of you to give not based on uh, how you feel, but put aside an amount every week or a month based on the need. Last week I asked you guys to take a certain amount of money, dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, and decide how you want to use it. Well, Kathy and I, we didn't do that specifically, but this last week we were like, hey, we want to give more above and beyond. So who are the organizations or individuals we want to give to? And so we talked about it, and right, Kath, and we're going through and we're contacting those missionaries and others to say, we'd like to give you more. What would you like? Of course, they'd say everything, but it's like, for what purpose? What do you want to do with it? And so I love that idea. We want to give more. What is it that we give and how much? And so it's something to think about. Next, 
proportionate to one's income, irregardless of one's income. In keeping with his income. Paul is saying when you give, give it proportionate to what you make. Those of you who make more should give more. And those of you who don't, you know, like youth, make less, give less. And we talk about the tithe, right? 10%. Oh, man, I got to give it, I got to give 10%. We look at it as the maximum. We look at it as the limit. No, 10%. In the Old Testament was the idea, this is the minimum you're to give. That's your being. That's the tithe. But there's also the offering. And so God says, we who are in the United States, if we're honest, we're the more wealthy. God has blessed us with more than your typical person. So we are to give proportionate to our income. I remember this story. A man goes to uh, his pastor for counseling. He said, Pastor, I feel really convicted because God has blessed me with a salary of $3,000 a week, and, and I'm not giving as much proportionate as I did when I was only making $500 a week. Lord, uh, uh, I, I want to give more. Can you pray for me? And the pastor said, bow your head. Let me put my hand on your shoulder. He said, Father, please bring this man back to a $500 a week salary so that he can be back in your will. You're like, whoa, that wasn't the kind of prayer he was thinking, right? But I love this truth. Tell me, look at this truth. Give according to your income, lest God make your income according to your giving. I don't know what you give, missions, organizations, the church, or whatever. But can you imagine this? Whatever you give in a year, your income, God's income to you will be 10 times greater than that. And that's it. How would we give if we knew God gave to what we give? Scary thought, huh? Think about it. You give $100 a month, God give down, brings your salary down to $1,000. You give 1000 a month, God raises your salary to 10000 a month. Think about it. Ready to go. Versus rush to put together. Saving it all up so when I come, no collection will have to be made. Too many organizations, too many churches, too many ministries scramble to put these special offerings together. Yes, we didn't know that Hurricane Ian was coming. We didn't know anything, although hurricane season always comes. We don't know about the floods and the tsunamis and stuff. But when they come, wouldn't it be great if we just kind of had money set aside so that when it happens, we're ready to give? Rather than taking extra weeks. Okay, we're going to raise money for Ian for the next three weeks. Well, these people are suffering right now. So think about that. Having the money set aside through the week. Maybe you do that. $50 a a week, uh, $10 a week. And you just raise some money so that by the end of the year, you're ready to go if there's some sort of emergency situation coming up. Finally, accountability versus non-accountability. And this, the first eight were verses one to two, but the last two, it says, then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. One of the things I note about rational, intentional giving is that the money is held in high esteem and accountability. At Journey of Faith, your leadership, the deacons and I, We take the monies that you guys donate very seriously. We are stewards of that money. And Deacon uh, Dan is our treasurer. And he is willing to give you an answer. If you have a specific question you have about the money, where it is, where it's going, everything, he can tell you all of it. Now, to be honest, we do have those congregational meetings, right? We have these meetings where he goes up and explains everything. And many of you don't go. Now, the way I can look at it is two ways. One is, wow, you trust us so much, you don't really need to hear how it is. Okay, yeah, I'll give my money to church, and and it's being used wisely. I'd hope and trust that's the reason why you're not coming. But the other, more cynical, is this. I just don't care. It just, it doesn't matter to me. I don't even have skin in the game, or very little. So whatever you do with the money is your business. So think about that. Verse tells the verse 4 tells us that Paul says, hey, I take the money you're donating, sir, so I will go, and I'll go with some men of yours, and we will hold each other accountable to make sure the church in Jerusalem has it. I think we need to handle money that way. And by the way, as your pastor, 
I don't handle the money. I don't want to know anything. I don't know anything about your giving. I don't know all, all that. Why? Because I don't want to be affected on how I treat you all based on what you give. That's between you and God, right? So we now see these nine differences between what I call, what I call intentional giving versus emotional giving. By the way, when I say emotional, that's not a negative thing. Emotional giving is a great kind of giving. I love doing that. You know, if you want to surprise your girlfriend with flowers, do it emotionally. Don't do it rationally, right? With your wife with a card, your husband with a new set of golf clubs, do it emotionally. Surprise them. It's, it's, It's an exciting thing. If you give your kids a cell phone, surprise them rather than plan it out. Ben, what do you think of that? Someday, you'll get one? Would you rather be surprised or you want to know? Do you even care? Okay, if you don't care, no cell phone. All right. So, but if, <laughs> but if you go to your sweetie and you say, honey, I looked up this gift. I looked at 10 different websites. I evaluated whether they had sales tax, the free shipping, or whatever. And I deduced that this is the best way to get your gift. Yeah, it might be nice, but it's not going to have the same appeal. You know what I mean? But on the other hand, in this experiential, touchy-feely age where everybody wants to experience God, and if you want to get God's work done, in my humble opinion, what Paul said right here is do it intentionally. Do it objectively. Think about it. Strategize it. Plan it out. And God will bless you for your thoughtfulness. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. And Lord, it is so great that we receive so much from you. But it's also important, Lord, that we realize that giving is so important. And so, Father, give us that opportunity to give. And to give with a heart and a mind that understands why we're doing what we're doing. We're going to thank you ahead of time for what you want to accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor uh, Derek. Please stand for the final song.
song as we close this time in prayer. Father, thank you. Let's exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, our Savior and Sanctifier. We thank you, Lord, for this time together. Help us to live each day for you. Help us to be generous in our giving for your work. We're going to thank you ahead of time for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day in the Lord.